Welcome to the Cross Border Interview Signature Series. From musicians to painters, from novelists to filmmakers, we're bringing you a diverse range of voices and perspectives, all united by their passion for their craft. And whether you're a longtime fan or a newcomer to their work, we are confident that you'll find something to inspire and captivate you in each and every interview. So join us as we journey across borders and cultures, discovering new and exciting talents and celebrating the power of art and entertainment, which brings people together. Now, today on the show, we welcome American novelist John St. Clair. John, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you very much for having me, Chris. John, I'm excited to talk to you about your novel, Stalin's Door. But before we do, I want to get a little bit of background on you. Where did your desire to write a book come from? Oh, my gosh. Great question. <laughs> Um, I've done a bunch of these, uh, I have to say this is probably my first uh, podcast type situation. I've done roundtable type things and I've done a whole bunch of written interviews for uh, for various uh, friends that have blogs and things. And I do get this question a lot. And I have to say um, that my desire to be a novelist or a writer, an author, if you will, uh, was, I believe, from the very beginning. I, I can't remember a time when I didn't want to be uh, a writer and author someone that, that would uh, work with words, get stories out, um, had that desire uh, longer than I can remember. So I, I know some people might um, discover writing later in life or they, they say, hey, let me try to write a novel or let me try to write a short story or something like that. I don't think there was a time where I wasn't uh, either writing or thinking about writing. Now, Did it come I, easy to you? It does... Um, I, I have to say that uh, it's it's easy because I like doing it. I think human beings are such that if you like doing something, the odds of you being good at it and wanting to continue doing that are greater than if you don't like doing something. You still might make good at it, but you're not going to be passionate about it. So I would say I'm passionate about it. I hope that I'm good at it. I hope that I have some some readers that that like uh, to 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 read what I write. Um, Maybe it's a too a bit premature or, or too egotistic to say that that I'm good at it, but I have some nice reviews that I can hang my hat on. So, uh, so there's that. Well, I want to talk about your first novel, and that's Stalin's Door right here for anyone who's watching this via YouTube. Um, for your first book out of the gate, you write a so succinctly, but also so. You paint a picture in this book that I don't think a lot of people can do in their very first novel. Before you talk about the writing process, talk to me about what Stalin's Door is all about. Okay. Um, it is called Stalin's Door. And so uh, most people, uh, if they know anything about history, may have heard of uh, the word Stalin, you know, Stalin, Hitler, World War II. Oh, that sounds Russian. Oh, I think he was involved in the war, something like that. You're absolutely correct. Joseph Stalin was the leader of the USSR for uh, many, many years, decades, uh, in fact. Um, he was the leader uh, of that country during World War II. And the, obviously the Russians played a huge part in, in winning World War II. They had uh, more casualties than every other country on the planet combined. I mean, they, they, their contribution to the, to the war uh, cannot be uh, overstated. If they, if they weren't in the war, I'm not sure what kind of world this would be in. Uh, today, so Stalin was the uh, was the leader. He he was also a, a dictator, an autocrat, um, somebody that is not favored very well. Looking back in history, uh, because of the things uh, that that occurred in his uh, uh, reign, if you will, uh, that there there was a lot of uh, things that went wrong. Uh, some of it was was deliberate. Some of it was just uh, by happenstance, by bad policy, or or um, you know things that could have been prevented. Um, but yeah, looking back, I would think you would find most people, and uh, most historians don't have a positive view, uh, of his time at the, at the helm of the country. So, so what does, how does a guy from Virginia of all places <laughs> think to himself, you know what, from my very first book, I'm going to write about pre-war Russia yep. and the perspective of three people. Where does the idea of this book come from? Because yeah. I've tried to figure that out and I still can't. I know, I've known you for some time now. Right. <laughs> it's it's a great question. I think the genesis likely came out of my uh, hobby, if you will, that preceded me writing this book. 
and that is studying World War II history. So I was a huge World War II history buff, still am. And in World War II, uh, people have heard of things like D-Day and, uh, you know, uh, the Pacific, you know, uh, uh, Pearl Harbor, those types of things. Um, in the European theater, where most of the uh, uh, fighting took place in World War II, uh, there's something called the Eastern Front. Now, that's the Eastern Front compared to whom they were fighting, which was the uh, the Allies, mostly Germany. And that's the, from the German perspective. So if you go east of Germany, you're going to run into, into Russia. And that's why it's called the Eastern Front. And most, ca most of the casualties in the war took place in that theater. Uh, and I would venture to say there were more, more casualties in that theater than every other place on the planet. So it, 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 if you are studying... World War II, um, the Eastern Front cannot be uh, understated as, as far as, you know, what happened there. And I was a, 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 a huge um, history buff when it comes to that uh, time period. Looking at uh, the Russian uh, perspective, um, it, the, the losses and the, and, the, and the contributions just cannot be uh, understated. So uh, that sort of probably drove my fascination with uh, trying to do something in Russia, trying to write something about Russia. The novel does take place uh, during World War II, but it starts out before the war. Uh, there's a there's a period of time that I can uh, uh, talk about right before the war called the Great Terror. That was a, a, a huge, um, very violent time in, in Soviet history. Uh, right before World War II, and probably to, to their detriment, had a, had a, a detrimental impact to the to, to the nation uh, right before that huge conflict. Not not a time to be um, sending all of your top military uh, elite uh, to the gulag. You, you're not going to do very well when you've got a when you've got a huge uh, three million man army on your doorstep. If you're if you're sending and and killing off all your generals and admirals, not a great move. So, um, a, again, a, a lot of what happened under the reign of Stalin uh, was deliberate and probably did not. It, it did not probably did, but it did cause a lot more uh, death and destruction than than it than it should have. So, since I was interested in World War II, um, I kind of went down the rabbit hole for Russian history for a little bit and how that led up to World War II. And then sometime along the way, I saw a really neat documentary. And this is apropos to where my book starts. There was a, a uh, building, a, uh, a, a living facility, uh, if you will, for the elite in, in the Russian government at the time, the Soviet government. And it's called the House on the Embankment. It, it, it's a, it's a, 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 a huge uh, apartment complex, if you will. It sits on the banks of the, of the Moscow River, downtown Moscow. You can't get more into the heart of Moscow than this uh, than this building. It was specifically um, designed and commissioned and built for the Soviet elite. And you might think, well, uh, why why would Stalin do this? Well, he was very paranoid, and he wanted to keep tabs on everybody that was working for him. If you were in a in a very senior position, and what better way to do that than to force physically force everyone that's working for him? It reports directly to him to live in one building that could then be coincidentally put under surveillance. And if you can keep tabs on all your enemies, then if you're very paranoid, I suppose that makes you sleep better at night, knowing that uh, everybody's all in one place and they can be surveilled. And if they say anything bad or they, they look like they're doing something incorrect, then they can be dealt with. Now, reading this book, I can tell that you it took you some time because there yes. is there we'll get into how long it took yep. you in yep. a few minutes. But I want to know how important was it for you to get the historical feel? Because this is pre-war Russia. There's not a lot of people around from pre-war Russia who would want to talk about this time in Russian history, Absolutely. let alone talk to an American. So right. when you were doing <laughs> your uh research on this and mm -hmm. making sure the feel because when you read a book you want to get that feel and i got the feel that i was in pre-war russia and moscow during this time how important was it for you when you're researching and writing this book to get the feel and the tone of what was going on correct because you for, did yeah for me it's it's absolutely crucial because if i didn't 
then I could have some other historian coming out saying, hey, hey your book, uh, maybe it was well written, but you really blew it on the, you know, the look and the feel or, hey, you got this, these facts incorrect or, or this other stuff didn't sound quite right. And, and now I'm calling into question all of your other things that are going on. I really wanted to be as historically accurate as I possibly could. Uh, a, a, because it would bug me if I didn't do that. But B, I didn't want someone else coming out and saying, hey, this book sucks because they they just really you know blew the history. Yeah, it's historical fiction. Everybody in the book is a fictional character except for one person who's Joseph Stalin, uh, the, the namesake of the book. Kind of hard to get around him. And he does make an appearance a couple times in the book, uh, as you know. But everyone else is made up. Now, uh, 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 or do they have a basis? But it sounds like you, and I apologize to interrupt, sure. but it sounds like you, when you wrote the family, when you wrote the daughter, when you wrote the husband, yeah, it doesn't sound like you're making them up. And that's what I think I, I was I really impressed with. When I read a book, I, I usually can tell what a story is and if it's a fake story and not. But when I was reading your book, I was like, like, are these real people? And then I actually had to go and like, are these real people? And he's just uh, like uh, guessing what was happening. But no, these are all fictional people. And I was impressed that you were able to write in that way. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, definitely fictional people, but could have these very easily been a uh, a, 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 a real person. The the husband of the daughter, who was the, the one of the main characters, was a uh, commissar back uh, before they called them ministers, and this what, what we would call in the United States would be uh, cabinet officials in the in the in the uh, in Canada. I believe they're called uh, uh, cabinet officials as well. Ca <laughs> correct. Yeah, I, 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 it's very similar to the UK. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Secretary. These are people that report directly to the president or the premier or the prime minister. Um, it, it, Joseph Stalin had the, had the same deal. There were various departments of of uh, Soviet government that needed. Uh, um, you know, as somebody in charge. And of course, all of those folks lived in the house on the embankment along with, you know, the top military people. And so the, the, uh, the husband of the main, I'm sorry, the father of the main character, Zhenya, uh, works for what they call the, uh, 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 commissar, commissariat of, uh, of water transportation, that this would be somewhat akin to probably in the United States, something like the coast guard or, or like a coast guard, uh, slash um, interior type uh, physician, somebody that was uh, uh, waterways, but not in a militaristic uh, um, fashion. So a pretty big deal. I mean, I think I, I think that commissariat had something like forty thousand people in it. So this 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 was a huge bureaucracy in, in itself. And and there were dozens of of commissariats. That there was internal security. There was other transportation type stuff. There was commerce and and uh, a anything that any large government would need had had an official in charge of it. And these folks reported directly to Stalin. So that was the basis of why is someone living there? Well, if to, to live in the house on the embankment, you have to be pretty important in the government. Okay, so here's a, here's a person that, that's going to be uh, living in there. Of course, they're going to have a family. So that's the daughter. They're going to be married. That's the, 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 the mother. And it sort of kind of grew out from there. Um, you know, why are these people here? What put them there? Uh, things started kind of dropping into place. So I would have to research, um, you know, the kinds of families that live there and, and the kind of environment they uh, they lived in. Um, it, it really was a, a compound. They never really had to leave this environment, nor were they allowed to really. Uh, everything was provided for them. They had any need that they needed provided for them right in the uh, in, in the complex. Um, While you're a student of history, were there things that you were you found when you were researching this book and researching how to write it that you were surprised at that you went, oh, this this is new to me and I'm going to put it in because I think it's a unique fact that not a lot of people know about. Oh, my gosh. Pro <laughs> just the actual building itself um, is is unique. It's still there today. There's a museum. You can see it. It's a, it's an apartment building. It's got probably mixed use office uh, uh, type uh uh, offices and, and and apartments and things it's still there today it's it's um it's a real place uh, it has real history um of course during what i described as the great terror which was basically 1936 to 1938 um hundreds and hundreds of families would have lived in the house in the embankment because as the purge went on um officials being arrested and then their families being uh, moved out new families would move in um, it wasn't uh, uncommon to have a flat that might have five families that lived there within one month because there was so much turmoil going on. 
Uh, somebody would denounce someone else, someone would get arrested, the, the whole family would move out, someone else would move in, the whole cycle would repeat. And so I just think the turnover in that facility, even though there was only 500 some apartments, uh, give or take, uh, thousands of people lived there just in those two years, just with the turnover going uh, with what was going on with the Great Terror. And uh, that that surprised me. I mean, that that's not a lot of uh, stability. Uh, if you want to have a government that that works, you can't be replacing the top officials, you know, every week and, and expect anything to meaningful to, to to get done. So uh, a huge amount of turnover. And uh, and in some cases, the vast majority of the cases, uh, nobody did anything to, to to get arrested. You know, these are just denunciations without any proof or anything. And then straight to the gulag if they were lucky. So you tell the story in three different uh perspectives the, yes. the, like i said the daughter yeah. the, uh, the father and the grandmother i want to talk about the daughter here for a second sure. because i always find it fascinating when and i i'm not bursting anyone's bubble here but <laughs> when a man writes for a woman as a young girl's perspective while you may not have uh, had the same experiences as this girl, and I, I, I pronounced it Zidia, but I guess I've been, I was, I read it in my head numerous times. Wrong. No worries. How do you, how do you Zhenya. pronounce the Zhenya. Zhenya is the name, and now that's that's her. If you, uh, if you recall, that's her um, diminutive name. That's what her parents would call her, or someone that's a very, very, very good friend. And that gets into that Russian primer that I put at the very beginning that explains that that familiar relationship where. Russians all have three names, and depending on whom you're dealing with and what their relationship to you is, and whether it's professional or family or anything, you're going to get called in any Russian uh, novel. Uh, there, there'll be five or six different names, and, and it could be very confusing for the reader. So I wanted to make sure that I put that primer at the beginning just to say, hey, uh, names can change at the drop of a hat depending on whom is speaking to whom and what their relationship is, and whether it's a diminutive or double diminutive, or you're going to use their uh, you know, a patronomic name or just their surname, you know, it, all of those things are, are, are key. And the author of any Russian uh, literature is not going to stop and explain. They're just going to, you know, present. And so the, the reader does, does need to, to have that knowledge uh, beforehand to see what's going on, or it could be confusing. So before we get back to the daughter, I want to sure. say I I want to thank you because you put a glossary at the back of yes, the book as yes. well, which yep. helped me immensely. No worries. I, I, try, going back I, try, I, re I'm, I have to apologize to my readers. I didn't think it would be four or five pages. I really tried to sprinkle in some Russian words, and these are transliterated words. Obviously, I'm writing in English. I was writing in Russian. You know, uh, it, it, it wouldn't need to be that, but uh, because they have a different alphabet, the Cyrillic versus, you know, the, the Roman – they're, the words are transliterated, and 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 what that simply means is there's an English um, uh, equivalent to any Russian word, and so when I would use some of these, I would sprinkle them in, you know, from time to time. I I would always try to explain the word in context in in the story. If you didn't want to go, then take a break and look in the back of the book. But just in case you did, I I put that that glossary in the back for any Russian transliterated word that I used, just in case uh, the reader needed it. So well, it, it would help me a lot. So thank you so much. <laughs> no, worries. no worries. No worries. <laughs> I want to talk about the perspectives because you tell three different perspectives. And usually yeah. when you tell a story like this from a, a perspective of one person, it's challenging. But when you do it three different ways, you're telling three different unique stories in one book while it all ties together. In a, and I don't want to say neat little bow. But <laughs> you, you, you challenge the reader to get outside the idea that what one person's feeling is not what the other person's feeling or what the third person's feeling. How, how did you weave the story so well? And was it a challenge to make the characters relatable in a way that you went, okay, I can't wait to get back to the daughter storyline. So that way I know what's happening with the father storyline. Right, right. And then maybe when the future happens, I can learn about what the grandmother's going through. Yep. You weave it so well together. How did you do it? I've got to ask because I I've, I'm writing a book and I find it challenging even writing in two perspectives. Well, I'll be, I can answer that question. Great question, by the way, Chris, terrific question. Um, I have to confess that I'm a little selfish. I love to, read any story that's in first person because i think you're getting a lot more intimate feelings for what the what the person and the, the character is experiencing i also like writing in first person for the exact same reason so i knew from the beginning hey this 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 novel is going to be in the first person well 
the, the main character, one of the, the three, Zhenya, starts the character starts the story out. If it was just from her point of view, you're only going to be aware of what the character knows. If the character is seeing something, if the character is experiencing something, the reader will know that. If there is an event happening that the character reading about in the first person point of view doesn't see or doesn't experience, that character has no knowledge of that. This is directly opposite to what the third person point of view is, which is sort of a more omniscient thing. You're you're sort of a, a person outside of the existence, but knows all, sees all, can tell all. There's also limited third person point of view, but most mostly third person is is uh, going to tell the reader things that the characters may not know themselves. Um, I prefer first person because only the things that the first person that the character experiences are going to be known to the reader. So when I kick off uh, Stalin's door, Zhenya, who's the the daughter, um, sees things and experiences experiences things in the first part of the story as a young woman, a young girl. Her viewpoint of the world is going to be very different than anyone else that's not in her shoes. She's living a privileged, compared to the rest of uh, the Soviet Union, a privileged existence. She's living in this house on the embankment and has all the luxuries, everything that she needs, everything's taken care of, school, everything, food, no worries uh, whatsoever. Very privileged existence, which is very different than anyone else uh, that was was living even in Moscow at the, at the time. So, and her age is is very young. And so her her worldview is going to be uh, such that things have to be explained or she has to ask questions or she sees things happening, but she doesn't understand and she has to ask questions and that will let the reader kind of uh, fill in some of the blanks. The other two characters are older. One one is sort of middle age and one is a, a, a grandmother type age. Um, their worldview and those their experiences also told from the first person point of view are very different from uh, from Zhenya. And uh, of, of course, they're only going to be aware of everything that they went through. And when they interact um, and, and they, they overlap, which they do, uh, those experiences can be shared. But, but if it's not known to the person, uh, the, the character, the main characters, it's not going to be known to the reader. So I have to tread very carefully to explain things. Maybe somebody isn't aware of what happened during the Great Terror or isn't aware of what a gulag is or isn't aware of what happened right before World War II. Those facts have to be presented and told from the point of view of a char- one of the characters and not like in an omniscient third person. Hey, let me let me give you some two, two pages of background like you would in a third person point of view story. I have to do it in such a way that it, that it reads uh, nicely and, th- and then it makes sense of why they're having this conversation and why you're you're being given this knowledge. And you do it in a way that lets the reader in on the journey. You you feel like you're there dealing with what she's dealing with at the time that she's dealing with it. You you kind of start, and I, I'm not trying to paint a rosy picture, but you kind of <laughs> start with like, everything's all okay. Everything's great because we're living in this sort of utopia. And then it shit hits the fan part, my French. Right. But you do it in a way that makes you 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 actually cringe from time to time when I read and I was like, oh, yeah. this is what's going on in these places. I didn't know this. <laughs> well, so, how about how about this? I mean, you're you've stumbled onto something, and, and a few people have have recognized this. The the especially the first part of the story, Genia's, it starts out in the spring, the spring of 1934. Things are rosy, you know. Things are happy. Things are blooming. Things are warm. Things are uh, uh, going great. Then we kind of transition to the summer and then, you know, things are the same way, but, but there are some clues happening. And this is a year later, each, each season in the first part takes place a year after the previous season. So then you go to the, the summer of 1935 and things are just starting to build up to the great terror. Once we get into the fall of 1936, things have really started to, to, to ramp up. People are disappearing. People are really on edge. Their, their neighbors are denouncing neighbors. And then of course, when they get into the winter of, 1937 everything is totally bleak uh, things are very very dark and it's just not a really good time and so i i typically i specifically incorporated these seasons uh for Zhenya as she's transitioning from something as you just mentioned rosy and bright and warm and, and sunny things go south very very quickly and then in in the winter um things are very very dark and and uh and and not not very happy at all we, we we talk about uh, life imitating art a little bit here because 
Um, Russia is a national player on the state world stage right now. And I know we're getting away from your book, but I want to know when writing this book, did you see similarities of what was happening today in Russia? Oh my gosh. That's a great question. Um, of course their government right now is very autocratic. Um, I don't know where the line from uh, uh, somebody who is an autocrat to dictator. I don't know where that where you cross that line. You you could say a leader is is, is a dictator. Um, maybe that's a little bit more hardcore than being an autocrat. Certainly, there at this point is very much closer to what they experienced in my book during the time of Joseph Stalin than than any other time uh, in, in Russia, at least in the modern uh, sense. Um, the democracy is, is not really uh, um, enjoyed there at the moment. Think, things are very top down, uh, planned out. Um, things are uh, not like uh, they. Things are very much like they were uh, in, in the time uh, that, that I explain in my book in, in, in the 30s and 40s. Um, why this is is uh, is going to be probably examined by historians for. For decades to come, but uh, they, the, the time that Russia is experiencing right now it is certainly not unknown to them. Um, that they, I, I joke, before. I jokingly asked this question, but could we see a Putin's door part two? Uh, I, you know what? Um, it, it, it's funny that the history repeats itself, knowing that it does. Um, I, I'm, I'm scratching my head at, at to what the end game is going to be because I think everybody knows inevitably. That there's going to be some kind of change there has to be and it, it, why this would be allowed to, to to repeat is is shocking because um i think once was was enough so uh, to have it happen again is is unconscionable i think i want to go back to the writing of the book here and i want to know because we, we jokingly you jokingly said yeah it took a while to write the book but a book <laughs> like this doesn't come from just a week of research and then a month of writing. This, oh, is, no, a, no, no. this is a lifetime project for you, isn't it? Uh, I don't know about lifetime. Certainly the first book that anyone writes, you could say, hey, all of my experiences were a prologue to me writing that first book. Sure, uh, I could, I'll, I'll, I'll stipulate to that and say that's, that's correct. But in specifically for this book, um, that it took about five years. I talk about that a little bit in the acknowledgments that, that this was uh, an iterative process. It started out as a short story that kind of focused on Genia. It expanded to the next character, Sava, and uh, they were sort of in the novella length at that point. And then I said, you know what? I think I'm going to keep going. We'll introduce one more character. And then Jenna comes back at the end um, and turn this into a real novel. And, and, and every time a new character would come about. More research would have to be done because they're in different circumstances. They had a different background. There were different things going. On. Um, you know, they're in Moscow. Then there's action that takes place in the Gulag. Then they're back to Moscow. I mean, things things are happening, and with every iteration, uh, more research would have to be done. Different time periods came into play, and of course, I was just really, really obsessed with getting it right. And so the the research was something you just can't rush. And as you said, this is not a weekend of. Uh, of coming up with some ideas and a month worth of research and writing it for a couple of weeks. No, no, this, this, this took literally years and I'm not kidding. It was a labor of love. And, um, it, it, once the story kind of started to, to take uh, a form, uh, it was an obsession. I wanted to get everything right. I wanted to write it correctly. I wanted to edit it correctly. I did all my editing, which I probably won't do again because it just nearly killed me. Um, uh, we're going to talk about that process yeah, here. No, no, I understand. But but to answer your question, it, it was a lot of research. And and maybe if I wrote something, I'm a huge fan of science fiction. People, all my friends and family was like, oh, wow, what, what is this? Why are you writing Russian history? What is this? We thought it was going to be science fiction. We thought it was going to be something along those lines because that's what you enjoy reading and, and, and talking about. The story kind of chose me. Uh, it, it took over. Um, I became very obsessed with it. Any any type of research, I was always researching. I was always thinking of ideas, always cross checking and uh, making sure all the details were correct because I just really wanted to do it the right way. And um, but is there a right way? I, I don't think there, to, I, I, there I is. I apologize not a right for way. asking that question. No, is there a right way to write no. a book like this? Nope. There's no right way and there's no wrong way. 
in, in my opinion. There's just the way that you are going to do it. There's the way I did it. You're going to write a book much differently than I am. Someone else that's listening to this is going to write their book and tell their story. And I don't want them to, to, I don't want to tell them to do it anyway. Even if they copied what I did, at some point, you're going to introduce your own um, uh, intricacies and, and idiosyncrasies to, to, to your writing style. And that's going to all be yours. And that's fine. Uh, I, I think uh, these, these how-to books and all that stuff, how to write a bestseller and all that, you know what? Just put those in the trash and just start writing. Your, your own voice is going to come out. Your own style is going to be evident. It's going to be uniquely yours. And you're not going to, it's not going to be like anything else out there because no one person is the same as another. So there's no wrong way to write a book and there's no right way to write a book. What did you learn about yourself while writing this book? Oh my gosh. Uh, well, first the off, it, 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 it just getting it done, getting, hitting publish, hitting that final you know, uh, return to, to, to send up the, the, the manuscript to Amazon and, and having that proof copy get mailed to you. And then you going through all that. So, I mean, what a tremendously rewarding experience. I mean, and, and when I say thing there, I'm going to get help the next time I, I probably overdid it. Time. I, I mean, I did the cover myself, uh, just doing the and doing all the, the artwork, get, getting all the editing. I, you know, I, I had some help the, the wall specifically I had commissioned, but I, I did all the cover stuff and, all the typesetting, all the editing. I mean, it's just killer. Um, to answer your question, to go through that process and and succeed, I think is is something that that, that surprised me. I read some statistic: uh, millions of people want to write a book. Ninety seven percent of those people that even attempt it will not even finish. So, right there, you and I, we're in the three percent because Woo! we actually we actually did the work to get it out there, get it in someone's hands. And, and when I did write this, I said, you know what? What's going to make me feel successful is when I get a review from someone that I don't know, never met, never saw them, didn't send them the book, didn't ask him to read it. When somebody buys my book and reads it and was kind enough then to send a review and I don't have any connection to them at all, then I think I'm successful. And it's not even it has to be a positive review. Somebody took time out to spend their hard mon earned money and and then their time to read this thing and and buy it and then leave a review, I, I think that's a tremendously rewarding as an author. You know, my my words are now in someone else's brain, and and I never met them. So now, before I ask this question, I should say that John and I have known each other for probably about a good three four months now, probably since December or yeah, November. Yeah, somewhere it's year. it's been a, it's been a few months. Yeah, yeah, and we know each other through a mutual friend, and uh, we do a roundtable where we talk about independent publishing and independent yep. authors. I want to know from your perspective, um, you chose the independent publishing route for yourself for Stalin's Door. Um, are you happy with that decision? I am. Um, to be honest, I was, <laughs> I, I think I said this on a, on a previous round table. I, I, I was probably very ignorant in the whole publishing world process when it comes to independent versus, um, uh, like some traditional publishing, uh, uh agreement, uh, you know, the whole, um, what do they call it? The whole querying process. I didn't, honestly, I didn't even know, uh, how to do anything other than the independent way since joining the twitter writing community there are many people that want to go the traditional route which means getting the agent writing a query getting someone uh, that publishes books to buy your book and then publish it you know if that's what you want to do great go for it i, I was ignorant and didn't know i mean of course you know that the stephen kings and the james patterson's and all that you know the big time people obviously they have agents and there's publishing houses that that, that work with them. So I knew that that was uh, a, a possibility, but really I wanted to have full control, do it myself, put it out on my own terms and just roll the dice and say, you know what, I'm going to do this all on my own. So I'm going to be successful on my own, or I'm going to fail on my own, but I'll have full control. And if it doesn't work, there's, there's the other way. And I'm not disparaging people that want to do the traditional route. Hey, if that works for you, go for it. I know people that have done both. I know people that only do it the other way. So uh, I'd say whatever you feel comfortable with and whatever you want. I only did it the independent way because I was very ignorant when I published this a couple of years ago. And I've learned so much since then. Um, may maybe the better question is, would I do it this way again for my second one? Probably. Um, of course, if somebody backs a, a dump truck full of cash up in my uh, driveway and, and empties out a whole bunch of dollars to, 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 to do some sort of book contract, 
And nobody's going to say no to that. But doing it the independent way, it gives you a lot more freedom. And I think it's a uh, it's rewarding for me. It's what works for me. So we, we've talked about the book. We've talked about the publishing process. Where can people find it? Oh, my gosh. Where can people find it, this it, book? And it, it, where can people find you? It's worldwide, believe it or not. <laughs> any Anywhere that Am – it's on Amazon at the moment. It's it's uh, uh, it's exclusive on Amazon for the ebook format. It's it's also available on Amazon in a hardcover and, and paperback version um, only because Amazon does everything. They, they, they print the book for you. They distribute the book for you. They host the, the site where you can buy the book. To answer a question, it's on Amazon. If you go to Amazon, whatever country you're in, can, Canada, UK, uh, Germany, uh, I've had 15 countries, believe it or not, that have bought this book, South Africa, um, anywhere that Amazon is uh, got a storefront, you 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 can find it, and and certainly the the, the big ones. Uh, the the link to Stalin's door via the Amazon, via the Canada and the U.S. Uh, links will be in the show yes. notes. So yeah. if you're listening to this on a in a car, please pull over before going to buy the book, or wait till you get <laughs> yeah. home. Just but Google my name, or, or yeah, yeah, just just go, look for Stalin's door in Amazon. It won't take you very long to find it. Um, it it's there. It's out available. It's it's in whatever format you want. It, actually. I take that back. It's not an audio right now. Uh, maybe one day I'll get somebody to to read this. I think that would be super cool. But yeah, it's it's on Amazon. So if you are on Amazon or if you want to get the book, um, it, it should be relatively easy to find. So you have, this is my last question for you, John, before we wrap up. Okay. Stalin's Door. It is a masterpiece and I'm not trying to blow smoke up your butt here, but I, I enjoyed it. I had to reread four or five chapters because I had to make sure I read it correctly because every time I read it, I got something new out of it every single time. And that's the, the crux of a good uh, author for me is when you have to reread something just to make oh, sure awesome. you got it and understand it. And I appreciate that. But while this is book one, what's next for John St. Clair? Um, that is a great question. I, uh, in, in my Twitter universe writing community, um, foray for the last couple of years, and I've met a ton of people, probably more through Twitter than any other format, which I think is terrific. A lot of people just like me, different backgrounds, different, uh, environments for, for, for letting them work different. Uh, some people have 10 books published. Some people have yet to publish. Some have only have one. Some have a couple. A lot of people do series type things. You know, they'll say book one, book two. Um, Stalin's Door is not a series. There's no planned sequel. Um, maybe I'll revisit that world at some point in the future. Who, who knows? But the next one is is not, and <laughs> this is crazy, it's not even Russian historical fiction. A lot of people will write different books, but they'll stay within the same genre, you know, whether it's, you know, paranormal romance or or you know, maybe some kind of uh, uh, drama or uh, detective type situation. Um, I don't know anyone else that's writing Russian historical fiction. So I thought that was kind of neat that I've got a niche uh, that, that is uh, a, a little bit off the beaten path. Um, something that you don't come across every day. But uh, there is no plans for a sequel or a series or a book two or anything like that. So I'm changing genres. And actually, I am changing time periods and countries. Um, It'll be, uh, the new book will be set in the U.S. It'll be in Boston. It'll be almost modern times. 2007 will sort of be when the story kicks off. Um, if I had to pick a genre, this is kind of loaded. It's going to technically be literary fiction, which is really what you classify something that doesn't have a genre. I know that sounds kind of um, backwards, but anything that says uh, literary fiction just means it can't be put into a category. It's not mystery. It's not crime. It's not uh, drama or, or romance. It's not science fiction. It's not horror. It, it all of those are subgenres. All of those are niche uh, uh, types of telling a story. If you're just telling a story, hey, here's a guy. He's in a coffee shop. It's nine a.m. He's talking to his buddy. You know, unless there's some sort of action that, that that would classify it as a genre, it's literary fiction. You're just having a conversation. It's more about the characters. It's more about the you know, what's going on, the interpersonal relationships versus the something that's driving the story. Like, hey, there's a bank robbery going over there. You know, what's what, what that's all about? Or, oh, hey, there's an alien invasion. Maybe we should, you know, duck duck under the table because they're blowing things up. Or, hey, maybe this is some war story. We're getting attacked. That That is going to drive the story and the characters will interact with that. 
versus not. So it's, um, I, I probably should say the title. I've mentioned this a whole bunch of times. It's uh, called Lucky Daniel McElhenney. There's a guy, he's a, a young man, and he's uh, Lucky Dan, Lucky Daniel. And, and uh, he's he's got uh, a whole bunch of things that are going right. And uh, it's, it's, it's a crazy situation going on, which I don't want to spoil. There's some mob stuff going on in Boston. Uh, Boston has a has a has a historic mob um, culture that that live in that area, and uh, that there's some brushes with the mob, and there's some brushes with the law, and there's some good luck that comes his way, and there's some other stuff going on. It's, it's just a crazy story. I t t I don't even want to mention what what the what the big thing is because that that's, and you that's don't a, even have to. It's John. a big spoiler because I don't. I mean, I, I I really want people to be surprised, but there there's a and uh, I think he's going to surprise you. He's uh, he's he's a pretty cool guy, and I think you'll like reading about him. But nothing to do with Russia, nothing to do with historical fiction or anything. It's it's just going to be total modern type stuff. History this time. There, there's no words you have to learn or or any type of uh, primer you have to read. It'll be. I've heard the Boston accent's pretty yeah. hard, so you might it, have to get the glossary back yeah. there for it, us it, Canadians. It, it'll be it'll be fun and enjoyable, um, and really heartfelt. And I'm and I'm looking forward to it coming out. The problem is, like with anything else, you can't uh, put a time frame. It, it's not like well for me anyway. Writing is not an assembly line. It's it's not something that you crank out. Oh, if I can just write fifty thousand words, it'll take care of itself. No, I want I want it to be. Um, really well thought of really well told uh, maybe a little bit of research just fun to, to 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 read and and that takes a lot of time and so anytime i would say uh here's when it's coming out uh, it, i'm gonna blow that deadline so i won't even bother but uh, it, it'll be fun it'll be exciting totally different and and i'm looking forward to it well i'm looking forward to it as well but john <laughs> i want to thank you so much for coming on and doing this yes. uh for those who are listening and watching Go pick up a copy of Stalin's Door, a novel by John St. Clair. It is available on Amazon Canada, Amazon America, or wherever you get your Amazon products. Yes. Highly recommend it. Yep. Um, John, much appreciate it for sitting down and talking about yourself, the book. And I would recommend this to anyone, even those who may not want to read a book. Go pick up this book because people like you, authors like you, need to be discovered more often and I, I wish people will pick this up because you will learn something about yourself mm -hmm. while reading this but you'll also re learn something about russia while reading this and that's always awesome. fun in this day yes. and age well so Chris, thank, you, so thank you no no no. i really appreciate the opportunity i am super grateful to be on your show and thank you so much for having me so with that, I want to remind everyone, a cop, the links to the show note in the show notes will be available for John's uh, uh, book, but also to his Twitter page as well. Go follow him. He's always uh, posting some good things on Twitter, which is always fun. And for those authors or novelists or painters or entertainers who are listening to this right now, and you want to be featured on the show, reach out to me, uh, follow us on Twitter, social media as well. And we'd be happy to have you on to talk about your book. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. And remember everyone just keep talking. <laughs>